Welcome to Waterproof Records with my first guest ever on the podcast. This is, uh, are you honored? So honored. So Thank you for having me. John no, Walker. Seriously, I'm, I, I'm, I'm really happy you started the podcast. I, I love hanging out with you. And uh, one of my favorite things is just sitting back and listening to you ramble on. And ramble so to on. be able to do that on my own time in podcast form is has been yeah. fun. And even now we live in the same city, but it's getting more and more difficult to get together. So this is a way that we can hang out remotely. Mm hmm. Exactly. Yes, exactly. So I'm gonna. I'll be the a permanent guest every time. Every time, every, every time. time. But you don't okay. have to say anything. Maybe you could be like my um, Paul Schaefer to David Letterman. You know, like you're just off there on yeah. the side with with an instrument ready <laughs> too, so that you could like almost play, but then you never do. Yeah, something like that. I love Paul Schaefer. I do too. He I love was Paul in Schaefer. Tap. Huh? He was in Spinal Tap. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. <laughs> Well, I, I and wanted Schitt's to Creek. Huh? And Shit's Creek. Was he in Shit's Creek? Mm-hmm. Remember, I don't remember uh, that when they had the the episode where Johnny Rose was reminiscing on his Christmas back in Oh, that's right. He's at the party. Back in the palace. Yeah. That's he's right. In the party. Now I remember. Mm-hmm. Well, I've done a couple of these and I'm thank you for saying that you're glad I started one. I you know, it's I already had the one podcast that I do, but when you when you do one individually it's interesting. You've done it before. I was on your podcast is, when you did this it. This is your podcast. It is mine. It belongs to me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I didn't even really know exactly what I was going to do when I started. I just knew that from the videos that I'd been making about reactions to songs, I was like, okay, well, I could pretty much talk endlessly about bands. And then when it came into my mind of like, like who I would have on the show, I was like, if I was going to have anybody on the show, it would be people that either A, I geeked out about music with before, and you and I have definitely done that. But then also people that are really close to music, creating music, writing music. Those are the people that I think offer a lot to to the conversation. Yeah. And, and eventually uh, uh, Tom Morello. Yeah, that's the goal. Let's get to Tom Morello. <laughs> I'll, I'll retweet any request. Yes. Well, whatever I can do to get Tom on here. Well, he apparently yeah. there's a couple reasons why he possibly could eventually be on my podcast. And that's one, because of the retweet that I got on my video. But then two, right. he plays D&D. He plays Dungeons and Dragons. And I feel like just one gander at the medieval tavern that we have in our garage. And he might be, you know, hightailing it over here and, you know, without even asking. So. Like That's in person, interview. in person, just not even Ooh. remote. Like he wants might to come stay play. the weekend. He might <laughs> stay the weekend. He's great. I've been. I have Sirius uh, uh, XM now. I never had it before. I sign up for it, uh, and he does a lot of the the hosting on Sirius with his mom. Have you ever heard him do that? Oh, it's no. crazy. That sounds mo- fun. Yeah, it's awesome. His mom's like ninety one. And they just sit there and he plays music and he always cuts to his mom and she's very feeble, very old, you can tell. Um, but uh, but it's pretty sweet. He's, you know, very knowledgeable music fan. So it's fun to hear. Yeah. His. What kind of music does he play? He plays. I mean, I think a lot of the stuff that I've been, it's called Tom Morello's, uh, I forget what the name of the program is, but he does a lot of 90s and alternative from that era. But then he'll throw complete left hooks and do something, com- you know, random, you know, some obscure punk band or something from the 70s or something, you know, something that he just wants to play. I think he that was his demand. He said, I'll host your show, yeah. but I have to have the freedom to share whatever I want to share. So, but anyway, but for those rage. of, yeah, Rage, Rage, yeah, he <laughs> plays a lot of Rage. He, he does play Rage <laughs> on there and Audio Slave and Prophets of Rage and all the things that he's involved in. Yeah. Um, but John Walker, uh, if you are listening to the show and you're asking yourself, who is John Walker? You know, is he the guy on uh, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier who um, becomes the evil? <laughs> Did you see that they that character's name was John Walker, by the way? The Falcon yeah, and, and I got like 
I got like 300 new Twitter followers, but then lost like 700 the week later when they realized it wasn't me. <laughs> that you're not a Falcon and Winter Soldier. <laughs> well, you are, you are a Chicago musician, multi-instrumentalist, uh, songwriter, singer. Um, I've known you since you were 17, I think. And uh, I think that was about the age that I met you as. And, um, yeah, you've been in many bands. You've been in Panic mm-hmm. of the Disco. You've been in the Young Veins. You've been a solo artist. You were in, what was your high school band? 504 Plan? Was that it? There was 504 Plan. There was, before that was Farewell Night. Farewell before Night. Before that was Centerfold. Before that was the Tennis Shoe Experiment. <laughs> so. Do you have an, any I Tennis think- Shoe Experiment recording still with you to this day? Uh, I'm sure I can get a hold of them if I, if I wanted to. I'm asking uh, for a reunion in 2022. We, we had a song called Evil Dead. Ooh. And it was literally about the plot to Evil Dead. That's great. <laughs> we were destined to be friends. Yeah. Well, yeah, I've the, been playing music. You have been forever. Yeah, when did you start playing guitar? Um, probably in like my early teenage years. My dad had always played uh and like in local bands yeah um he was a huge like Jimi hendrix fan so they kind of had like a blues rock thing and then from that my oldest brother was also in a band and uh same like bluesy rocky kind of stuff and yeah yeah just growing up seeing them two play it always seemed like something that was really cool so yeah, I probably started playing with their guitars before I was a, a teen, but actually kind of got my own and started becoming a little bit more proficient in like 13, 14 years old. Yeah, I was around the same age when I got my yeah. first cheap Harmony electric guitar. It was a <laughs> Fender knockoff and I got it for Christmas. And those first few months that you have your guitar and you suck and it's really frustrating and you get mad because you you want to like skip ahead to already being able to know how to play, you know, and getting the calluses Mm -hmm. and everything. But you, I was, I was the opposite. I learned an E minor chord and that's the only chord I knew for like a year, but I was so impressed with myself. It's the only (laughs) one you need to know is the E minor chord. Yeah. One of, one of three. (laughs) Yeah. You were so impressed. You're like, I'm amazing with this E minor chord. That's incredible. Well, and, and my first guitar was like a cheap, $100 $100 Ibanez acoustic guitar and it's still like one of my favorite guitars. I don't know if it's <clears throat> the nostalgia or Do you still have it? I still have it. Yeah. Oh, oh I'm jealous. That's actually pretty yeah. significant to hold on to it. I mine's long gone, you know, cuz it I was so oh. angry at it at the time cuz it was so crappy. I you were so anxious to get a better instrument. But now I kind of in hindsight wish I still had it. What what do you what happened to it? Uh, I think I pr- traded it up. You know, back then, you you as you're getting better, you go into the right. um, the local music store and you say, "Can I can I sell this to you?" And then you'll give me the fifty bucks or whatever, and I can put it towards my next guitar. So it's somewhere in Ooh. Tulsa, Oklahoma. So you somewhere. got ripped off, is what you're I saying. got ripped off, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Yeah, no, so so yeah, I started around that same age. What were the bands that you? Um, what what you get that time in your life is really where you get totally obsessed with certain types of bands and artists. What was the thing for you that was that was pulling you in and wanting you to make a, you know start a band and playing live music and everything? Yeah, so uh, I mean, growing up, the Beatles were definitely like <clears throat> the one band in my life that I feel like was that. I'm wearing a was Beatles that? shirt. I had to show it. Oh yeah, there they are. <laughs> And Go you got on. a Beatles record behind you. I do. That's my mother's. That belongs to that yeah. that she bought that when she was a a, a kid. So, right. Anyway, go on. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason that they're still considered one of the best bands of all time. I mean, yeah. Ticket to Ride, it's classic. Yesterday, so many good ones. Michelle, <laughs> just list Nowhere all of man. them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so, so yeah, I feel like. I feel like there was a good few years where that was all I was listening to. Uh, I mean, from seven, eight years old, I remember like listening to the Beatles and just sitting in my room and like drawing and just totally immersed in my own musical magic world. Yeah. Um, And then when I started playing guitar, actually, my brother is 10 years older than me. 
And so, uh, and then I have another brother five years older than me. So I was getting a lot of music from both of them. Um, my oldest brother uh, was like really into like punk rock music. Yeah. And there was like a few like small punk rock bands from Chicago that he was like friends with or, you know, a fan of that he would go see on the weekends. And uh, those bands, there's one band in particular, Oblivion, that I still listen to to this day. And like, you know, almost no one has heard of them, but uh, I've never heard they, of them. they just they just still have that that place in my heart, you know, that. Yeah. Yeah, of course. The moment uh, it, like transports me right back to the first time I, I heard them and just kind of opening my eyes to the possibilities of what kind of music could be made because they were a lot different from the Beatles, you know, fast kind of yeah. three piece punk rock. But they yeah. also kind of incorporated like cool chord changes and fun quirky songwriting so it kind of encapsulated that spirit of the beatles but sure. it was totally different and so i think from then on i just kind of that's when it really burst open and i started realizing how many cool bands there were out there yeah uh and just musicians i mean it's it's quite a spectrum of yeah of sure. uh, of art of artistry can you still find Oblivion's music? Is it something that you can easily, you know, find streaming somewhere that if anybody wanted to check out Oblivion or is it? So like- they do, they, they do have uh, an album on Spotify. Um, one of their, they, I think they broke up in like 2000 and mm-hmm. there's an album they put out right before that. That's on Spotify. But some of my favorite stuff is uh, some of their earlier stuff. And I think it's on, on Bandcamp, which is actually where I found it, yeah. um, re found it after I, you know, lost track of it throughout the years. And so, yeah, I think even like a year ago, I, I downloaded the albums off of Bandcamp and now they're the only, uh, band on my iTunes on my phone, because obviously really? mostly everything else is on streaming services. Streaming services. Yeah. Same for but, me. Uh, but yeah, uh, wow. I think it's oblivion, uk.bandcap.com all right well he got got a big shout out to oblivion guys out there in the world they can get some more streams (laughs) on their music well so so then that leads you through your teenage years you grew up in the chicago suburbs and played Mm -hmm. in those bands that you listed earlier and you know i met you um we're family i mean through marriage now but back then technically technically we're not related by blood (laughs) but we're family because I remember, so my wife, Jamie, her cousin is Cassie. Cassie is John's wife. And back then, you know, Cassie was a teenager and I was coming around dating this girl, Jamie, and I met, you know, and then, and then Jamie and I get married and I'm, you know, I know her cousin Cassie very well. And then I remember when Cassie started dating you, I remember her saying to me, she's like, I'm dating this guy, John, and you're going to love him. You're going to love him or something like that. So cute. So cute. This is cute. Come on. We got to share the cute part. So (laughs) she said that and then she was so right. You and I are about eight years apart. I think, I think that's about the, the age gap, but you, I was about to go off to college and then move to LA. And this is around the time that I meet you. You're a teenager, but we clicked like right away. We had similar interests in music. We had, uh, we like to joke and laugh together and we just had a lot of fun. And so you were like, you know, when you're, when you're with somebody and you're in a relationship and you gain members of the family, there's always these wins that you get, you get like members that you go, yay, I got a new friend. And you were, you were that person for me. I was so excited about it. And we kept in touch while Jamie and I were finding our way through Los Angeles and you and Cassie came and visited us here. And mm-hmm. we always had our friendship um, you know, building and over the years, you know, we had, we had that time that we stayed and floated in that pool with all the cans of beers around us in Santa travel Monica. Lodge. Yeah. Santa travel Monica. Lodge. And mm-hmm. during this time, um, cause it was a more efficient way of communicating. We would IM each other. We would instant message each other. I would be at like work. And I think at the time you were working at a, like a restaurant, maybe. Am I remembering yeah, right? I was, I was a, I was a waiter or I was working at uh, Best Buy. Something like that. Those were my two jobs, yeah. And I, so I had, a, I had some friends that I would talk to, and you were, were you, did you end up going to a film school or something where you shot videos and stuff like that? Like, I, I vaguely remember that you did. 
Yeah, I did. So, so I, I, those, the, all those bands I named off <laughs> were all in high school. Basically I started yeah. base, uh, freshman year. Um, and then by my senior year, I was in a band, uh, 504 plan that wasn't, um, they didn't go to my school. They were a couple of years older. And so I was actually a fan of that band. I would go see their shows. Mm-hmm. Um, going back to like our, my favorite music or my formative music, a lot of the bands that formed my musical taste and like mm-hmm. my ambition to being a, in a band were all these local bands in Chicago Yeah, that, uh, that I would go see. Um, so there's like Spitalfield and 504 Plan was the band I ended up joining and Knockout and, and Fall Out Boy was one of the bands that was kind of all yeah. coming up around the same time. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so so I had done all that. And even uh, like my senior year of high school, um, 504 Plan actually did some touring, you know, so we left Chicago. We were already doing pretty well there. So we decided to see like, you know, a week or two on the East coast just to see like, you know, we're yeah. young, we're a young band. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> all that kind of came tumbling down, like right as I was getting, uh, right as I was graduating high school. Right. Right. And so, yeah, it was kind of like after that, I had a little bit of like a existential crisis of like music and what am I supposed to be doing? And this is around the time we would be messaging each other back and yeah. forth. Yeah. And so, uh, so yeah, I ended up going to Columbia college in Chicago. I for remember film. This. Yeah. Um, going is maybe a little generous. I went for <laughs> a few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you shot something. I remember it was like a plant in a windowsill or something. Am I remembering this right? Didn't you send I me shot, something? I shot a few things on my own before yeah. I went there. That's kind of where okay. I was maybe like, then that's what it was. Yeah, that's kind of where I got the idea of like, well, maybe film is cool because you know I had been in a bunch of bands already. It was it was kind of tough. Like, yeah, a lot of drama. Everybody's on different pages. Touring was a lot of fun and I loved playing shows, but it it was also taxing even, you know, even at at that that age, you, even even as a, that's a really interesting thing to, even as a teenager, you got a glimpse and saying, well, this is hard. This is tricky. And it was also like the most fun I ever had. Yeah. But then I would come home and like transitioning back to normal life was really hard. So it was just really confusing. Like all these things were happening and I I was having fun, but. Also, the band was like in the middle of breaking up because a few of the guys didn't like it even. They liked it less than I did, you know, and I had my own reservations. And so, uh, yeah, this was basically around the time we started messaging. And I remember us both kind of feeling like we had uh, we had so much creativity that we wanted to get out, but we just didn't know how to do it. (laughs) I was also going through an existential crisis because I had just picked up everything, gotten married at a ridiculously young age and moved to Los Angeles. And I was like, you know, I was coming to the city trying to be an actor and it's a nightmare when you, when you won, you don't have any money. You don't know how to like start with anything. And so I also felt like, yeah, it felt kind of like a, like a ball of fire that was being held really, really tightly and couldn't do anything with it. You know, I'm going to this day job and I'm like, I, I came here to pursue art and create things and I can't do jack shit. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, should I get a day job? Like, what am I doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah like, exactly. No. no, please don't do it. <laughs> I, I mean, these are like verbatim conversations. I'm like, don't because it's killing me. Although I had to have it at the time because yeah. it was like, how else were we going to eat or pay t- stupid L.A. prices, which, you know, yeah. more <laughs> now that I you was, live here. I was still living at home at the time. Yeah. But this was this was know. an interesting time. So you were feeling it, I was feeling it, and that's I mean, this is of course why we became such good friends at the time. Is that it was a, even though we were years apart, we were going through these windows, and um, you know. But then this is around the time that some pretty interesting stuff happens, and it starts with you being a guitar tech on the road, really, right? Like that kind of yeah, kind of so, the thing that happens. So uh, those talks with you are invaluable to me. I feel like having someone to vent your like 
shallow, creative, frustrate, you know, yeah. to the normal person who has a normal job and doesn't have a creative ambition that is like a huge, you know, <laughs> stretch, yeah, uh, yeah. A, a long shot or whatever, yeah. it can feel a little, it can, it can just feel isolating to not have someone to <clears throat> talk to, to vent to. Yeah, yeah, to vent to yeah. about about just those frustrations. Sure. Um, so having you and identifying that same kind of like creative drive, but also trying to be rational, but also trying to take a leap. You know, it's a confusing yeah. it spot a con- to be in. Yeah, it really is. <clears throat> um, and so I feel like uh, I got when I so I went to Columbia. And I was there for a few weeks <clears throat> when uh, an ex bandmate of mine was going on tour with another band he had joined. Uh, the Academy is. Yes. They had just gotten signed to Fueled by Ramen, which was the uh, label that Fall Out Boy had recently got signed to, um, yeah. which was like big news in Chicago. You know, yeah. uh, their first album had just come out and kind of like took took a hold of everybody. And so they asked me um, to come on tour with them to do video work because I had already been kind of dabbling in that. And I thought to myself like, all right, well, I'm going to school for this. Um, But even within the first few weeks of my classes, I had only been taking one film class and the, you know, I'd taken a few other things like music theory and like I took a television production class. I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to do something creative. So I yeah. thought like that would be a good way to, to, to figure it out. Sure. Um, but yeah, they just something in my mind. I just felt like it was a, like a once in a lifetime opportunity just to get to go just on to tour go. and, yeah. and, and get paid to like make videos with my friends and go to different cities and why uh, I was a big fan of the Academy. So just to be with a band that I liked watching every yeah. night was, was kind of like a dream come true. Yeah. And so, uh, <clears throat> and so, yeah, I, I, how would you say, I guess I dropped out of school. <laughs> <laughs> you dropped out, you college drop out. Yeah. No, I yeah, you, you made the choice. <clears throat> I dropped out like a week after I w- would have been able to get like a refund. And so <laughs> that was kind of, dev- <laughs> that was kind of devastating. But, you know, at the time, I mean, at the time I didn't even think about it in hindsight, yeah. like it's yeah. insane to, to have, I mean, I amassed a lot of debt in that few weeks. <laughs> Didn't we all? Didn't we all? I did a foolish thing like that too. I had gotten an acting scholarship to college and without even thinking through um, by my sophomore year, I decided to switch over to English because I was done with the theater program. Mm -hmm. And they were like, yeah, okay, well, you lost your scholarship. I didn't even think about it. I literally just made these impulse decisions and I was like, yeah, I'm done with the theater department. And then they took away my scholarship and then I accumulated all this extra debt that I didn't need. So anyway, I let <laughs> Freddie Mac deal with it. Yeah, right. <clears throat> exactly. If you want to hear mm-hmm. more about Jacob's uh, coming up, you can listen to him on my podcast, John Walker's podcast. That's I only right. Recorded 15 episodes because <laughs> I'm, I'm too lazy to do any more. You was a great podcast and I was your guest on that. And they, yeah. if they would like to hear about my coming up, it's on your show. That's so great. It is. Yeah. But you, so you draw, you, you get out of school, you go on the road. And during this time, I got a chance to see you. You came through Los Angeles more than once and Jamie and I didn't have kids. So it was really cool because, you know, we were young, newly married, but you would, you would say, Hey, I'm going to be passing through LA and we would meet up with you and we got to hang out with you and the guys from the Academy is on the bus. And we even filmed like a sketch video on the bus that was on YouTube for a couple of years. I don't know if it's there anymore, but Thai TV, they called it. Remember that? Yeah, yeah you are days. technically someone's godfather. <laughs> yes, or something. There was a there was a big uh, argument about him having a child and who was going to be the godfather. It was, and they it cut was Johnny Minardi, right? Johnny Minardi, like and then A&R his of uh, yes, Johnny Minardi, records. and then there was another guy on the bus who had blonde hair and I'm drawing a blank on his name, but he was the one who was up for the role of Godfather as well. It was all coin toss and Jamie and I are there anyway, it's great times and you would pass through town, but this is right around the time that you would get to know a group of other musicians that were 
on a, a on tour and then they would be not needing their bass player anymore and this is where life gets really interesting uh for a minute so tell us a little bit about how that all went down that's right so uh the first tour i did with the academy was two months long and so that was the longest tour i'd ever done yeah. you know in high school we were only out for a couple of weeks at a time and that was kind of exhausting but the academy actually had a tour bus because they were gaining some success and they had support from their label. And yeah. uh, so again, it was like a dream come true to be on a tour bus and like, to, it was so cool. You know, we were having so much fun and, uh, but at the same time it was a really grueling life. And so yeah. after those two months, uh, I came back home and it had kind of been un, unspoken whether or not like I was going to come back out. I started doing the the video stuff, but I also was kind of acting as their guitar tech because they didn't really right. have, uh, they had one guy um, kind of doing it all and he was tour managing. And so, uh, and so, yeah, for me, I was just kind of like, wasn't sure if that's really the position I wanted to be in doing all that. And I wanted to do the film more, but I, I didn't have enough time to do that. Yeah. And, uh, and, but, um, I th so I think we had some sort of conversation where I think they had ended up getting another guitar tech for this next tour. It was going to be like another two month long tour. Yeah. And, uh, they still needed my help, like being a roadie and stuff, but I was going to have more time doing video. And so I went on that tour, uh, and that tour was with, um, acceptance was headlining the tour and then okay. the academy was main support and panic at the disco was opening for them yeah uh this was like right as their first album came out so 2006 kind of, 2006 it, this was 2006 or late 2005 oh, okay okay um, so i'm not yeah maybe their album hadn't come out i'm i'm not completely sure but it was already kind of clear that they were taking off yeah. Like they were opening out of all three of these bands and they had like the craziest crowds and um, they were selling the most merch. Yeah. And so like right away there was kind of this like, wow, this band is, is taken off. And yeah, I had gotten the album. Um, so the must have came out cause I'd gotten the album before we went on the tour. Yeah. And at first it was like, it really took me back. Like it was kind of like things I'd heard before, but also like nothing like I'd ever heard. Yeah. And so at first it was a little off putting, but me and Cassie, my now wife, like listened to it in the car a few times and ended up really kind of digging it. Yeah. And so, uh, so I did that tour with the Academy, the, the second tour. Um, and right away, like I was intrigued and wanted to watch them play and, the first day of tour, I introduced myself to Ryan, the guitar player, and we yeah. kind of like hit it off right away. Yeah. Um, he had had like a guitar pedal that broke and they didn't have a guitar tech because they were still such a young man. They were, they were in a van at this time. So here these bands are in tour buses, but uh, they were in a maybe van. they were in a van at that time, but they didn't have a guitar tech. Yeah, and they were they were deal. younger too. So, so so you were always weren't you like a year and a half older than they were at least? Yeah, or two? one or two years older. One or two years um, older. So they they mm. were still teenagers at this time, and so you were right at yeah, the I think end I was of your 20. teens. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Nineteen twenty. I remember that. Yeah. Right. So yeah, the first day of tour, I met Ryan, and we we hit it off. I I fixed one of his guitar pedals, and like then from there we started talking music, and we started playing guitars after shows and stuff like that, and. Yeah, within like the first few weeks of that tour, they had kind of mentioned to me that they were thinking about letting go of their bass player because they had some drama with him and um, they were just kind of looking for someone who could step up both in like musicianship and like helping a little bit more with songwriting. And, yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, they kind of broached the subject to me, but nothing was ever really set in stone. Like, you know, I, don't, I didn't try out we didn't really talk about it that much um, it until the official. end of the tour until the end of the tour where they were kind of more like, okay, well, so you'd be down to do this. Like if this is what we did and I'd be like, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
um, I, I'm, I'm a college dropout, so. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we all called on. you in the family, too. Like, you know, we just, <laughs> right. John, the college dropout. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, so yeah, I, I'm, it, all, it all happened kind of quick. I think the tour ended. I still was unsure whether or not they wanted me to join. They had, had like a three-week tour in Japan after that. So they were like, they didn't have cell phones. Like we weren't really communicating during that time. Yeah. But I, <clears throat> I took it upon myself to learn the the set because I'd yeah. been watching it every night. I had the album. You knew the songs. I knew the songs. I've always played music by ear, so it was pretty easy for me to kind of figure it all out. And, yeah. Um, and so I was at Cassie, my my now wife's uh, formal for her school. It was like freshman yeah. year of college and we were at her formal dance and I'd gotten a message from them basically saying that uh, they were playing a show in LA and that their bass player didn't show up and that if I could meet them and this was like in 12 hours in 12 hours like it was yeah. the night before I remember <laughs> all this by the show. way hearing yeah. through the fam and hearing through you yeah so I was like, yeah, sure. Okay. So I hopped on a red eye from Chicago. I landed in LA at like 6am. I took a cab to Irvine, which is where the K rock weenie roast was, which is yes, the show they were yes. playing. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, that was my first show. I went on stage. We'd never practiced before. We like, uh, went over a few transitional things in the dressing room and then we went on and, and there you I were. I played like 80% of the set pretty good. Yeah. And was this a show and, and pardon me if I'm mixing up memories cause it's been a while, but was this the show where they put you in boots that didn't fit your feet or was that in London? <laughs> no. At that, at, that was later. That, that was England, right? Like weird, you, weird you flew, stuff like that happened, happened a lot. Like because there were wardrobe. clothing aesthetics that they were like trying uh-huh. to put you into because the band had the, had that look, that That's emo, right. you know, so, kind of smeared so mascara. So that didn't happen until a little bit later. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, the, I reluctantly wore eyeliner a couple times. <laughs> Guyliner, Guyliner. It was a great look. I remember seeing you wear it. Um, but you, you, uh, yeah. So, so I just remember that story the most cause you were on TV. Um, and, and so we were watching and I remember there were people saying like, that's not Brent, you know, like this was like that moment where people were realizing they're like filming you or, or you you're on stage and they're starting to comment on like, who's this guy? Like, am I remembering that correctly? Like, like people, fans were going, I don't think that's Brent. (laughs) Yeah. That was happening a lot. Again, this was pre Twitter. Yeah. This is pre a lot of the social media. Yeah. I think there was still a MySpace. I think panic main like social media was a live journal. Yeah. Live journal. (laughs) Like, and it was like just on their website, but it was like just posts from the band or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So funny enough, that first show, like I said, I was at Cassie's formal. Yeah. So I was already in like a suit. dress clothes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're serious. you were halfway there. They just had to tear it <laughs> and smear yeah. something on you or yeah. put some bedazzling or something. That's right. <laughs> That record, I got to say, you said when you first heard it, for me, it was the same thing. You know, you're my, you're my buddy. And the first time somebody hands me that first record, it took me a minute. It took me a minute because I wasn't yeah. quite ready for, not that it's not a great classic, uh, you know, of the time album, but it was something that I wasn't ready for. It was kind of like not really in the lane of what I was listening to at the time. And so as I listened to it, I was like, Oh, okay, cool. I get it. I get it. But it was, it felt, it felt like I was kind of like, um, I was only in my twenties, but I already felt too old for that album when I heard it. You know what I mean? I was already like, I think I'm too, too grown up for this right now. So that was, that was kind of my initial reaction. I had a similar experience with, uh, Radiohead's okay computer. Yeah. When I first heard it, it was like so different from what I was used to from Radiohead and just yeah. from like modern rock bands yeah, in general. It was so out of the box. And like it took a while to digest, but then quickly became like one of my favorite albums because again, going back to the Beatles, like all these random weird elements that like they somehow figured out how to combine them all in like an, uh, such a manner that only Radiohead could do, you yeah. know? Yeah. <laughs> or the Beatles or yeah. Panic for that matter. Yeah. 
So you're in Panic of the Disco, and it's crazy because it's like, here's this guy who's a college dropout, like total. <laughs> I like I like calling you that, by the way. Um, no, but you're 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 in the band. It's crazy. We're all excited about it. You're you're going on tour, and that era essentially for you is 2007 to 2010. Is that the window of time that it is? Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. So so when I when we that after that first show, it was basically like. 18 straight months of touring. Yeah. And so Um, here you were earlier going two months on the road and then this literally became magnify that (laughs) quite significantly. Right. That's right. Uh, And the band was like really blowing up at the time. And so literally like the only way I can really describe it was like almost on a daily basis, like a new dream was coming true. Yeah. You know, it was like, Oh my God, we're playing in front of 5,000 people oh my God, we're on The Tonight Show. Oh my God, we're on SNL. We're on Rolling Stone. What? I know, every like, day. Wow. Every, every week there was new news of like just things I never imagined I'd be able to do in my life and they were yeah. all happening like in my, as, as a 20 year old. Yeah, you were playing Times Square for Dick Clark. <laughs> right. That's that was, right, yeah. That was a ball drop. <laughs> R.I.P. Dick you, Clark. You dropped um, the ball. Yeah, but it, it was it was a really surreal time. You saw the world. But one of the things I always think is so interesting is is I think this is a good glimpse from my audience is that you would tell me like I would ask about you've been to all these cities. You travel the world when you're on tour and I would ask you about a city and it was you would always relay to me that you don't really get to see the city. You, right. you are, you are off a plane, you are shuttled to where you need to go. You play the show and you're out of there. And on a rare occasion, you have a little time to stretch your legs and experience an area, but you've been all over the world. But a lot of times you didn't get to experience the place at all. That's, that's true, right? Yeah. Almost never. I mean, almost never. <clears throat> yeah. You know, there was a time where we were playing like theaters. Uh, yeah. and so theaters are usually more in like the heart of town every theater is a little bit more different. So there's character and you can go and try the local food and walk around for a bit before the show. But pretty quickly the band got so big that we were playing, you know, small arenas. Yeah. Arenas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And most arenas are in the middle of nowhere. uh, And they're all kind of this, they must use the same architect because every dressing room is just like a 20 by 20 cinder block room and with no windows. And yeah. Um, And so that was really jarring to kind of like all of a sudden that being our day to day. And and we, we tried to make it cool. You know, we had like, we would like candles and hang up tapestries. We had like a little video game thing we would bring on tour with us. We, we brought a foosball table with us. That's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) And so like we made our own entertainment, but yeah, it wasn't really traveling or like seeing places. It was, it was definitely a job. And, and it I definitely I, felt like a grind after a while. Yeah. And I don't think a lot of people know that, you know, because when you're an outsider looking in, you think it's just glamour and it's always this thing, but it is, there's a lot to it. And I'm not here saying like, oh, it's a hard life. I'm just saying that, um, it, it's not what you think it is. It's not this, you travel the world and you see these montage videos of bands kind of goofing around in the middle of, you know, um, Saigon or whatever. It's like, that's not, nece- that doesn't necessarily happen for everybody. It's like you go from city yeah, to city. Those montage videos are like five minutes long and there's 24 hours in a day. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And it's because the publicist was like, let's go over real quick and shoot this thing and let's get out of here and let's go over here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's again, a crazy, I, I, I don't, I, you know, in hindsight, I don't like complaining about it because even like for his groundhog day as it was, it still was like, it. Yeah. it still was my dreams coming true. It was still yeah. like the best job I ever had and may ever have, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah it was a cool time. But yeah, it, it, there is a moment where you realize that, uh, it's not as glamorous as it's made out to be for better or worse. Yeah. Some of the cool stories that I got to experience with you during this time, actually pre panic, I think you're still a guitar tech at this point, but it was when, um, all American rejects that tour, we, we went to Mm -hmm. a diner and we hung out that night and the guitar player for all American rejects was like at the other table. 
um, from when we were in this diner super late. And then there was this one time I got to go to Pete Wentz's house, I think, with you. We went to go hang out over there. And, then, you know, that was when he was with Ashley Simpson, I think. So she was there. So there were, there were all these things over the years that would happen when you would pass through town. And I was like, I can't believe this is John's, like, regular day to day. You know, it was mm-hmm. a surreal time. But um, then you come to L.A. and it's time to record Pretty Odd. And that was a cool time, too, because I got to hang out with you a ton during this time, I got to see you, yeah. you know, uh, all the time I got to come to the studio. I got to experience some of the stuff as it was happening. Well, not, not during pretty odd. I don't think, I don't think I, cause you guys recorded that like elsewhere. Didn't you? We recorded that in Vegas, Vegas. That's right. At I don't the, think I got to the, come there. At the Palm casino, the Palm casino. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I got to come to the, I got to come to the studio. young veins. That's what I got to come see. That's right. But even, even, uh, when we were doing pretty odd, we had some writing sessions and like rehearsal in, in LA and I, feel I like came we to back and forth more for that. Yeah. 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 And that was an amazing time again. Like, so when I joined the band, we were on tour for 18 months and that was amazing. But I was like, I was still a hired gun basically. You know, I was, uh, I was playing other people's songs and yeah. it was fun. I had, a, I had a blast, but, um, it wasn't until we started writing for pretty odd and like some of my ideas started to come to fruition and like, were really being valued and actualized that it felt so much more fulfilling to me. Like, yeah. you know, cause I'd always, in all the bands I had been in prior, I was always kind of the songwriter and I sang in a few of them and, uh, for me, like just getting that initial idea out of your heart is like the most fulfilling thing to me in music. Sure. And so when that started happening, it was like, you know, after 18 months of my dreams coming true every day, it was actual affirmation that like, no, this is what, this is what actually makes me happy. Like the going to play SNL wears off in mid, mid song at SNL. Yeah. I'm like, okay, now I'm here. Cool. I did it. Yeah. But it's the writing of and music. No, and, and, and we're playing a song and there's no crowd and this is kind of weird. And I get the historical significance, but you know. Yeah. You're in your own head a little bit, or at least yeah. I was. Yeah, you were. Yeah. Always and in so, your own head. <laughs> and so going, yeah, right. <laughs> For better or worse. For better or worse. Um <laughs> And so writing, writing the album and recording the album and being a part of that process was like a whole new world and kind of made up for some of the grueling parts of that, that prior 18 months. Yeah. Um, Yeah. It was amazing. Again, like I feel, I still have to kind of look back and pinch myself and just be reminded of how grateful I am to have been able to work with like such talented musicians and engineers and producers and, uh, and yeah, to have the chance to, to experience music at that level. Um, yeah. but at the same time, uh, I feel like going into the writing process, um, there was a lot of tension in the band. There was, a, there was some tension in the band before I had even joined. Uh, yeah. and so over, that initial first, uh, those 18 months of touring, I felt like I, I was kind of like the mediator, you yeah. know, um, trying to give everybody some perspective. Again, they were young, they were overwhelmed. Sure. Uh, everybody kind of had their own issues and demons they were dealing with. And, uh, <clears throat> I felt really grateful to be that, to be able to play that role as me as, as kind of mediator or like kind of the glue keeping the peace between everybody. Um, and that kind of went on through the writing process and recording of pretty odd. Uh, and then even after we released the album, we did a few more tours and, uh, it was, it was, it was still a lot of fun, but the record didn't get received as it didn't take off as hot as uh, the first album did. It basically. was a total switch uh, in gears. You know a, what I mean? It was like a total it, switch in sound. It yeah. was also like right as Napster and all these things. Napster had already been a thing. 
Yeah. But like by the time 2009 rolls around, which is when Pretty Odd came out, or 2008, um, every headline you read, read in music magazines was about how CD sales are falling because of right. the internet, you know? And so people are pirating and not downloading. Is, yeah. Right. So whether or not it was because our, our album sucked or just because of the landscape of the market, the label like really wasn't having pretty odd. And that kind of drove a lot of tension. It like heightened a lot of tension in the band. Sure. Uh, as far as direction and goals and, uh, you know, the balance we wanted between artistic integrity and uh, just wanting to, something that was successful and had longevity. And yeah, we were just all on different pages. So we did a couple tours on Pretty Odd. I, I, I mean, it was probably a good six, eight months of touring. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> but then at the end of that cycle, we all had kind of been burned out and uh, me and Ryan especially were writing a lot during that time and um, really wanted to scale back the touring to focus on writing more. Cause yeah. we, we kind of noticed that the more we toured, the less energy we had to be creative. And we kind of were worried that if we didn't strike while the creative iron was hot, you know, yeah. we would lose momentum. Yeah, and we've heard um, and from think, even when you were a teenager that this was something you were aware of back then, that right. how much this could take it out of you. So it makes sense it would be 10 times that feeling now. But on the other end of the spectrum, I think there was a lot of worry that if we didn't keep touring and striking while that uh, attention iron was hot, yeah. that we would lose our moment. And yeah. so, so, yeah, it all happened kind of quickly I, again. I was the oldest member at 22 at this point, maybe 23. And, uh, and yeah, it, it all happened kind of quick. Um, you know, it's funny, like we didn't really even have like a big band meeting to decide whether or not we were going to split up. It just kind of like, it just kind of happened. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Ryan and Spencer had met once and had like a lunch and kind of talked it over. And after that lunch, it was kind of like, yeah, well, obviously like we're going to end up hating each other forever if things keep going this way. So what should we do about it? And, uh, and so, yeah, the band decided to split up and, um, and so they went their separate ways and they ended up continuing as, as panic. And me and Ryan had already written a bunch of songs, um, for the next album, uh, for the next panic album. And so we had already, we, we were already kind of like ready to record the next album more or less. Yeah. And so after the, 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 the decision to split, we formed our own band, uh, and recorded those songs under the young veins. Yeah. Great album. Thanks. I got to go to those recording sessions. So I feel really close to them because I was, you were living up in, um, you and Ryan were living up in a house in the middle of nowhere on a mountain. And I got to go hang out with you guys and go to the studio. And that was a really memorable time that you guys were putting that stuff together. So that was a total shift for you. I did want to, before we leave this era, I did want to tell one story because you're the only person I would feel comfortable telling this story to, which is, um, so not that I had anything to do of the shift to the pretty odd sound, but I was there in the early days when demos were being cut and songs were being recorded and it was a lot more like fever, you know, it was a lot more of that kind of theatrical, you know, I don't know, circus alt, <laughs> whatever it was. Yeah. It was like, it still had this, you know, Danny Elfman kind of vibe to it. And I remember hearing some of those early songs and then I had gone to go see this movie with my friend, uh, Peter. He took me to this film once, which is a very well known movie. And, um, and I was really moved by it. And I remember I told you, and I think you, you we all got to go. I think it was me, you, uh, Ryan, uh, not Ryan. It was me, you, Spencer and Brendan. I don't think Ryan was able to go. Um, at least that's how I remember it. Is that how am I remembering correctly? It's all three of us. I mean, all four of us. Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I take, I take them to go see the movie once and it was, it is a very stripped down movie about the song being the most important thing, the, the, the artistry 
um, behind the music and not really writing for anything other than the feeling of the music. And I just remember leaving that experience. We saw it in arc light. And I remember the band having this general feeling after the, the movie was happening. Not that I had anything to do with it because there was other things going on. But it was like, a, we need to switch gears. We need to, we need to go in a different direction. And so I've always held on to that as a, as a memory that I'm like, I helped change the direction <laughs> of the band. But I know I didn't. I know I didn't. But it was a, it was a, it was, there was a flip of the switch because things were going in a similar direction as they were. And those are referred to something that you've talked about, I think, before. Those demos, right, that are unreleased. Aren't they called? Yeah, something? so it was it was it was uh it was kind of like a concept album. It was it was tentatively titled Crif- Cricket and Clover. Cricket and Clover. That's the one that you've you've joked yeah. about on your socials that people lose their minds on when you say I because did, you, I didn't joke about it. I genuinely was excited because I thought the songs were lost, and then my father in law had ended up keeping a CD with all those demos on it. Really. And so when I found it, I was like so excited because yeah. I mean, there's some really cool stuff on there. And again, yeah. it's not it's not necessarily pop music. It's definitely more of like a theatrical kind I of I remember it. I dance. heard some of the songs back then. Yeah. Some of it, yeah. Yeah. And so yeah, I was just kind of like overzealously tweeted, like, oh my God, I found these. Uh but so then, you weren't yeah, joking. Kind of, you were you were liter- literally happy and excited that you found it. But I was then, happy and excited. But then like quickly realized how like I how quickly realized that yeah, I, I, unless the band agrees to it, I like you no can't one's do ever anything. Hear him. You know? yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. Yeah. The enthusiasm was there. It was like, yeah. And then you realized, oh, this is going to be embroiled in like a legal discussion about who can hear this song. Hear right. I songs. mean, I never, I never, I never, uh, assumed I would release them myself, but yeah. I, I, I guess I was tweeting it to hope that someone knew that they still existed if they ever wanted to release them somehow. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. Well, so, so what I was going to say is, so we ended pretty odd era. You're in young veins and then you guys toured on that as well. I got a chance to see you guys play live at the Troubadour during the young veins period as well. And you and Ryan still keep up and, and talk all the time. But, um, you guys, after that record, the, the young veins kind of dissolved as well. Correct. Yeah. Uh, a, a indefinite hiatus, indefinite is hiatus. What I like to call it. I'm, I'm still holding out that we may do something one day cause I love writing songs with Ryan. There's yeah. Like, when I look back is kind of one of my most cherished memories. I feel like I grew a lot as a songwriter and was able to help him branch out from what he was doing. And it was just a really, uh, yeah, really organic collaboration that, you know, neither of us had had to ever really try too hard to get on each other's page. Um, And that's kind of, that's rare when dealing with creative collaboration. I feel like it's hard to let your guard down and just, let the uh, juices flow. Yeah. Like we do when we um, do sketches and videos and stuff, right? Like we do. Or even just hanging out. Yeah, just you hanging know, out, there's yeah. a feeling you get with someone when you're just comfortable with them and yeah. you know, it's few and far between. You trust them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and so, yeah, it kind of fizzled out before it even began, you know, like sure. whatever drama was going on with panic, you know, was kind of intertwined with me and Ryan's relationship too. You know, we had different mm. lives different goals, uh, different tastes, different, a lot of things. Um, yeah. but we were so deep in our writing process that like we wanted to see these songs through. Sure. And so we put out the album we did a couple tours. I mean, we were probably again on tour for like five, six months, more or less straight after the album came out. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, during that time, it just kind of became clear that um, – or, yeah, maybe nothing came, became clearer, but there was just a feeling that something wasn't right. Sure. You know, even to this day, I look back, and I don't know exactly what it was, but something was telling me that I couldn't sustain a life on the road um, like we had been doing. Yeah. And uh, – <clears throat> And Ryan was was dealing with his own stuff, and we were still being managed by the the same management as Panic. So there was like this weird overlap 
sure. uh, that still felt like some of the things we were struggling with were like carried over to this new project. So, so yeah, unfortunately after those two tours, I was the one who kind of decided like that I couldn't really keep on doing it at the pace we were doing it. Um, which is why I kind of wanted to refer to it as a indefinite hiatus because, um, it's not that I don't want to do it. I just sure. couldn't make it my everything. Yeah. Um, you know, and just bigger picture, I feel like, again, watching your videos and seeing all these bands, I mean, there's such a rich history of music and we've only been recording music for like a hundred years. Yeah. Uh, and most of these bands stories are pretty tragic. Yeah. Like it, it just from the beginning coming most creative people usually have some sort of trauma in their life that they're trying to express or deal with or process, which is why they get into art because it's, you're able to convey a message on a lot of levels instead of just, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's magic, you know? Yeah, it is. (laughs) It is. For lack of a better term. Art comes from pain and, 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 difficult times and, and turmoil and trauma. And, and so that's where, and, a even, lot of these people and even, and even if writing a song can help express some of that pain, it doesn't necessarily alleviate it. Right. And then having to sing that song about your pain every night, day in, day out <clears throat> can, can take a toll. Yeah. Um, and, and again, so for me, I, I kind of just had the realization that, I wanted to have a little bit more of a multidimensional life and I didn't want to have these other band members like who were kind of depending on me to write another album or, you know, want to keep going on the road to keep the momentum going. And, uh, yeah, again, it's funny talking about it now. It feels like kind of, I'm like from a place of privilege because I had success young I was, I'm able to sustain a more simple life now. Sure. Uh, as far as, you know, my artistic life, I can write songs and record them at my own leisure. I don't feel like I have to tour, uh, more or less than I want to. Um, it's a sweet spot for me, but it took a lot of hard work and sacrifice to get there. So, yeah. Well, you know, it's worth mentioning now that you've never stopped writing and you still write music all the time. And you just released, you've released tons of stuff independently since the end of the young veins. You have many EPs and albums that are available online. Literally so, every song I've written more or less since then I've released. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, every you, there is a plethora of music that you can hear and I highly recommend everybody to check it out because you know, this is not, this is not me just uh, saying this because we're family and we're, we're best buds, but I love your songwriting. I think it's tremendous. And I think that each thing that you put out, you're always trying to push the limits and try new things and, and explore new territory as a songwriter. And, um, you guys definitely have to go check it out. So, so if you haven't heard John Walker's um, music, what are the best places that they can find, uh, your music now? Just search you on Spotify. Yeah. The internet, the internet, just type in John Walker, but not the Falcon and the winter soldier, uh, captain America, John Walker, not that guy, different John Walker. That's right. (laughs) Yeah, I've got a bunch of stuff on the internet, Spotify and the rest. Um, like I said, I basically release everything I record. I record most of it myself or with yeah. friends in their bedrooms. And I've done a few things in a studio, but more or less it's been pretty DIY. And that's been inten- uh, intentional because yeah, I feel like when I was in panic especially, once you reach a certain level of success, there's just kind of a machine that you're part of. Uh, and the resources are great and the opportunities are great, but I do feel like it, there's something, it takes away something, uh, that, that I had when, before I had success, you know, from just writing a song or recording a song just to, just to get it out and just to learn how to write better songs. 
And yeah. so I'm really grateful that my solo stuff, um, that I just, just have this feeling that I can keep doing better. You know, it's yeah. like this ongoing process for me where every time I release something, I'm like, okay, what's next? You yeah. Know, what, how can I write that better? Or what, how can I make my lyrics better? Or how can I do something I haven't tried before? Um, and yeah, having the freedom to do that uh, without upsetting other band members has, has been nice. Yeah, I hear you. That's the thing about art. That's the thing about creativity is that, you know, I'll, I'm going to say a quote that I love to share. I haven't had a chance to say it on the um, on the podcast yet, but there's this book by this woman named Brenda Uland, and I think she's long since passed on, but it's a book about how to write. Um, and it's basically, it's called If You Want to Write. And I, there's a passage in it where she talks about art and like what art actually is. And I think this applies for music, for film, for anything. Um, she talks about how Van Gogh was writing letters to his brother, you know, and they were living in different cities and he was writing and saying, Oh, this, the sky every night here is so beautiful. And he's writing to his brother and he's basically saying, it's so beautiful. Let me draw it for you. And he draws it in the bottom of the letter that he sends to his brother who lives many cities away. And she said, that's art. That's art. And it's in its purest form because that is, I am seeing something or experiencing something. I want to interpret it and then I want to share it. And that's like the most pure version of what we try to do. And even with as silly as it is me saying these TikTok videos and the music reaction videos, the bigger it gets, the further away it gets from where you began. It gets so large and it gets pulled into like doing things for other people or trying to figure out how to fulfill something or I listen to this comment and this person says this and now I think this or or you know I'm experiencing it on a just a micro level right now with with people's interpretation of who I am and what I can offer them but I think that once you started making your own music and where you are now is it it just remains in that place where you go here is an idea Here's my interpretation or here's my vision for it. And I want to share it with you. And I think that that's all we can try to do. And if that brings success, it's great. But at the end of the day, we'll, we'll be able to die knowing that we stayed true to that very thing. And that that's all that matters. Right. And I'm not, and I'm not damning commercial success. No, no, know? definitely not. That's... I want it. <laughs> <laughs> Please bring me that deal guys. Please give me that sponsor. I need it. <laughs> yeah, I I think that's really that's just kind of an important thing to to note though is that it's not this it's not the success it yeah everybody's different everybody's paths are different everybody's sure. goals are different uh, and again back to like me feeling like I it took me all my dreams coming true to kind of realize what was actually necessary for my own happiness and. It, turns out it's not a lot yeah like, you don't need much a warm cup of coffee in the morning and and uh and and sleeping in the same bed more or less every night yeah and that's <laughs> enough uh, and, and again and with artistic success same thing like to get to a point where i'm not worried about how well my stuff is doing as much as how well i feel like i'm doing as a creator as as a as a writer like am i improving and that's really that's the only thing that makes me truly passionate is is not only to be happy with what i've done but to know i can do better yeah um, or at least think i can yeah you know? so no i think that's an that's, important that's, caveat it's it, it's the drive you yeah know? it's it's uh, a, and uh, yeah any any advice i could give would be that, you know, is, is that it's really the journey and not the destination. Yeah. Little Alan Watts action, right? <laughs> Love Watts. Yeah, I do too. Um, Except all his, uh, you know, his, his, his problematic his stuff. His porn? No, I'm just kidding. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to say, yeah, I mean, that's what we're leaving with. And, and I, I, I agree. There's nothing wrong. Back when we were growing up and we were talking about the bands that we listened to, remember there was always a thing and there still is to this day, the stigma about selling out. And like, if you sold out and you lose your street cred, if you sell out and commercial success, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with making it. 
but it's really just about all about retaining a sense of self and who you are and what you want to do. And I think that that's the, you know, look, I, I'm 43 years old. If success came to me now, um, I've lived a life without it for so long. I don't know how I'd be anything other than myself. And that's the challenge I think of when success is found at a young age, uh, not for everybody. Some people deal with it effortlessly, but, um, for a lot of people young, it's like, you just don't know who you are yet. And you're still finding your way through life and figuring out what it is that makes you happy and what it is that you want. Mm -hmm. And you got people whispering in your ear and saying, you should do this. You should try this. Or, you know, it'd be a great idea this. And it just, it can make the, you know, better than I do because you live in New York. (laughs) Right. Exactly. (laughs) Clearly, you know, (laughs) clearly you're smart and you have my best interests at heart. Yeah. But, um, yeah, go ahead. Give me more money. (laughs) New York guy. (laughs) Give me more money. I'll totally stay true to myself. I'll stay true to myself. Just keep paying (laughs) me more and more. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, I, I, I was excited to have you on the show because, you know, we've, we, we're music fans. We love, uh, listening to bands. You showed me a lot of artists. I remember you bringing me burn CDs of, of, um, you know, artists as you came and visited and we've talked about a lot of bands along the way, but it, you, you have an interesting story. And I think being on this show, it at least gives my listeners a chance to kind of hear the John Walker story about where you were and how you got where you are to this day. People who follow your career, they already know it, but there's going to be a lot of people I think that, uh, that would be uh, interested to learn about how this all went down. And, and, um, what is it right now that, that is really, what are the artists or, or bands or songs that are really doing it for you these days? What are you feeling? Uh, not to be cheesy, but the stuff you are sharing has been really inspirational to me. I Yay! feel like getting to relive some of this music with you. And That's like awesome. you ca- encapsulate the feeling of the magic. Yeah, thanks, man. That music is able to convey. I don't know exactly what it is. You can't write it down. Obviously, you can make TikTok videos. To, <laughs> to, to, yeah. To, to, but yeah, just that, just that excitement of the power of music to to change your life. It in does. A few seconds. A few seconds. It really can. You know, for those who get it. And the people who listen to the show probably get it more than anybody. It, it, there's just those moments you hear a song and it blows you away. And even in my busy adult life with having kids and a family and a job, I've forgotten too. And so these videos are just as, as beneficial to me because now I'm going back and I'm like, oh yeah, my entire life used to revolve around listening to music and now I'm doing it yeah. again. So and it still does subconsciously. It does. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so anyway, well, John Walker, Thank you so much for coming on to Waterproof Records. Is there any parting thoughts that you have with uh, the listeners before we wrap up here today? Jacob Gibbons, thank you for having me. I look forward to hearing more of your episodes. (laughs) Thank you, sir. I can't wait to hang uh, out again. We get to hang out in a couple weeks. We get to go see a live band. We are going to see a live band. Yes. Um, I can't wait. I can't wait. It's going to be really, really fun. No, I don't have any words to say to anybody. Figure it out for yourself. (laughs) Figure it out. (laughs) Sell out. That's what we're saying. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Well, thanks, man. Um, I'm actually going to just say goodbye there, and then we'll, we'll stop recording. So goodbye. Goodbye. Things are going to change. I can feel it. It just won't be that kind of fun.